So I'm just waiting for Rachel to show up so we can record the podcast. Sorry, it's January the 1st. It's always a, a challenging day. Yeah, I'm just waiting for Rachel. Uh, any sign of it yet? Uh, this is Rachel. Go for Rachel. Still holding for Rachel. Any any time. Any any time. Okay, well, look, well, we can't wait for Rachel, so you and me are just going to have to do this podcast anyway. Uh, okay, that's Hello, fine. everyone. Welcome to 2024. We made it! <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was it was close to here, I've got to tell you. Whew. So interestingly, I've already read stuff online where people are like, I can't wait for 2024 to be over because 2025 is the year where it's at. And I'm like, oh, OK, just a filler year. Oh, did, oh, oh, people, do, do you not learn? Do you not learn? It is. I, I'm pretty sure people said in, at the end of 2015 that they, they, they don't really care about 2016 uh, and it's going to be a forgettable year. And it showed us. So, so come on, let, let us not antagonise the, uh, the calendar gods, as it were. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's predominantly to do with the fact GTA 6 is not out till 2025 and basically there's no Marvel movies this year. Is the vibe that people do, are saying? Do people not know that just because they have said GTA 6 is coming out in 2025 does not mean it will come out in 2025 because... I, 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 I will place I tell, I tell you what Rachel here and now you and I, I I will place a bet on a a bottle of alcohol of your choice but that f- game doesn't come out until 2026 mm, don't know don't know if I'm prepared to take that bet it's meant to come out in spring so I can fully see it not coming around till autumn mm, I'm, 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 I'm alcohol of your choice we, 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 we can pin that we can come back and visit it later on tune in in 2025 to find out if Rachel gets her bottle of alcohol uh, but we're not here to talk about GTA 5 6 or um, alcohol we're here to talk about the the controversial one I can't get over how this is the controversial movie out of all the movies they've made yeah, uh, The Last Jedi, a, a film that has, for reasons which to this day I still cannot fully understand, divided audiences to to such an extent where I have seen people legitimately say that Attack of the Clones, the Star Wars Holiday Special, the Ewok movies are better than this film. I mean, having recently watched Attack of the Clones... Yeah. Uh... It, uh, I mean... <laughs> Oh, wow. It's... Look, I get people might not like the film. I get that, you know. F- films are not for everyone. But to objectively say that Attack of the Clones or The Phantom Menace is a better f- film than this, I I, 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 don't, I just... I do not see it. And it infuriates me somewhat, I have to say. So... Uh- I make no bones about it. This was my favourite film of the new trilogy when it came out. I've gone to the hilt for this movie on several occasions, uh, but I wanted to come at it today objectively, um, as I have done with all of them. Um, And I was like, you know, I'm going to be critical of this movie. I want to be able to be critical and, you know, really try and understand where all the hate is coming from. And... (laughs) I don't get it. I can't see why the hate is there in the ferociousness that it is for this film. Mm. Um, I I think it's very interesting. A couple of weeks ago before Christmas, um, it was the six-year anniversary. Uh, I think me and you spoke about this at the time, Andy. Um, yes. And lots of people did posts about, you know, six years since uh, The Last Jedi. And the post themselves would be positive yeah and then the comments there'd be you know tens to hundreds of comments of people saying how it killed star wars for them you're, you're right it, it, it was very much the case that the people posting it were generally posting very positive things and about how, how they enjoyed it and, and how they like the characterizations and how it helped them deal with traumas and understandings and then li- literally if, if you go into any of them it was just threads upon threads upon threads of sorry Tweets upon tweets upon tweets. I am not fucking calling it threads or posts or whatever they call. But all these tweets of people just saying about how much they despised and hated it. And and like I said, it's fine not enjoying something. It's fine not liking it. But the levels of vitriol that are thrown towards it are just a, a little bit mind-boggling. I, I well, think this, this film ruined people's childhoods. 
and you know killed Star Wars for them um, in a way that made me wonder if actually it was directed by a woman um, but I did check and it's not uh, so I don't know what the answer is here See, weirdly enough I never saw anyone make that claim that it ruined their childhood certainly not in the same way that you used to see with the prequel films so I, never saw I, that I wonder claim. if that's generational people who are my age who obviously the prequels were their childhood um, this film ruined their childhood I saw lots of people who kind of met my age range as it were mm. a little bit younger that said this ruined their childhood and and i i think it might well be the case that um i i i have said before and, and I, I stand by this having just watched this now this i think is the best film that is in the star wars saga as and and, and i let me explain that I, I mean this is the best film in a in a narrative sense, in a production design sense, in a in a story sense, I think this is the best film. I do not think, though, this is a good Star Wars film. And I've spoken before about how *Revenge of the Sith* is the best Star Wars film because I think what this film is, this is a deconstruction of what a Star Wars film is. This is basically saying we're going to take all the tropes and all these familiar things and and, and you know all these aspects of, of what you've come to expect from a Star Wars film and we're going to turn them on the head turn them inside out and explore them in a different way and I find that very appealing but I suspect that a lot of people who did not expect that going in especially after having seen the the, uh, the mystery box fan fiction that was The Force Awakens were not expecting that at all and I feel it maybe it's just a whiplash thing of of going from one to the other I disagree this is not a Star Wars film I actually found what, because I believe I've spoken with you on several occasions in the past about how this is. Please do not, do not insinuate we, we socialise outside of this podcast. This sorry, is a, sorry, it's sorry. a strictly podcasting sorry. relationship. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, for me, actually, this was very Star wars in places. There was stuff that made me think, oh, yeah, this is Star Wars. And we'll, I'm sure we'll get to those. But particularly for me, the depiction of Yoda was peak Star Wars. Um, Phasma, I felt, was peak Star Wars. Um, and there's some other bits in there, but I felt like it was a Star Wars of The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. It was that type of Star Wars. It was not a New Hope, Phantom Menace style Star Wars. Um, and I think you're right. I don't think audiences, I think audiences went in and had such a, a sugar rush bubblegum experience with The Force Awakens um, to then be treated to a war film, a thinking war film, which is I think what this is or, or has elements of yeah, they were probably quite jarred by that Yeah I, 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 mean, I mean, look there's a lot of elements and, and I will say this is the first time I feel we've seen Yoda since Return of the Jedi because whatever appears in the prequel films uh, and everything, that's, that's just not Yoda, is it? That's Bob uh, we'll, we'll call him Bob there. But this this felt like, you know, the, the Yoda. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are elements of, of Star Wars. It's the same way as the other ones. But I think this this is a film that's full of subtext in my mind. And and what the subtext here is basically saying is to, saying to people like me, people who are, you know, 30, 40-year-old men who have grown up with Star Wars, who, who had such a visceral reaction to the prequels and who have kind of made their entire personalities and their entire lives around the deification of this franchise that this isn't for you this this you know you have to let things go you have to allow things to grow and to move on I mean, a few of the standout lines in here that i absolutely adore take off that childish mask um this isn't going to go the way you expect um you know they are they are what we they grow beyond we are what they grow beyond you know it, it's this theme throughout here of you need to be able to you, you can love Star Wars you can appreciate Star Wars you can do it but do not hide it on so high of a pedestal that you will not allow other people to explore it and to appreciate it and to let it to grow and let it move beyond what you have what you have known and for me that was you know the core of this film this is this is a film let the past die kill it if you have to He's not saying in that moment that none of the Star Wars is valid and exists and he has to do it. But what he's saying is do not hold on so tightly to the legacy of what has gone before that you will not uh, be willing to explore and, and discover new stories and sensations and moments. And I love that messaging. I love that story. And I tell you what, that is not something you get in a Star Wars film. You do not get that on a 1930s serial, you know, showing at the cinema right before the start of whatever Western you're about to show. You get that in a probably 
set late 70s uh, it, 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 this is kind of like the unforgiven or the um, once upon a time in the west of star wars films this is taking what was you know a very tropey kind of um genre based show and it is basically giving it a a critical eye and it, it is giving it the um the attentions of a master filmmaker and that's for me why this is my favorite film in the star wars saga if it is not the best star wars film i have to disagree with you slightly oh wow so I, this is the one where we're kicking it off are we th- this is the, this one is that the we- power of the last jedi <laughs> violent disagreements okay come on strange hit me with it so i agree that there is some message about moving on from the past i actually don't think that's the main message and i think that's the problem with audiences is that is the main message they took away and that wasn't the main message i actually think you know it's not a film about hating the past it's not a film about undoing the work of legends i do agree there is stuff about you know not putting your legends on a pedestal that whole thing with luke you know it's not leia's beacon that that reignites the resistance it's the knowledge that luke skywalker was there you know, there's there's all there's there's that subtext, but I actually think this is a film about making mistakes and learning from them, and we have already been taught that lesson in Star Wars, twice. They told a bit of that in the original series. We had that with Luke going to face uh, Vader half cocked, and you know loses his arm in the process, and Anakin does the same thing where he takes on. Uh, Dooku and and get sliced up beforehand. The difference is Anakin didn't learn from his mistake and Luke did. And this is a film that where the characters learn from their mistakes. That is predominantly Poe Dameron um, and learning to trust others and that he doesn't have all the information and, you know, his mistakes. He does. There is it very clearly. He makes a choice at the start, which gets a load of people killed. And he makes the exact opposite choice when he's presented with a near identical set of circumstances at the end. It's cyclical. It is about it's learning. Like poetry. It rhymes. It is. Uh, <laughs> I, I will point out there's several other steps along the way of making entirely new and different mistakes before he does get up to that realization. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't disagree with that. It's it's a long journey, but but it does. It bookends with a mistake and then not making the same mistake. That is the bookend. Um, you, see, you see, you see. That's the thing. I, I, I don't. I don't disagree that. Oh God, I'm saying that now. I agree. There is definitely a theme throughout here about you know mistakes and and that wonderful line from Yoda about you know failure. The greatest teacher of all is failure, uh, and, and I just love that entire sequence of Yoda. I love Yoda in this film. It, he is so. Do you remember when we spoke in the past about how you didn't get why Yoda was kind of special? And I think a lot of that just comes from your experiences of Yoda in the prequels. I completely Yoda, agree with you. This Yoda here is like the Yoda verse. Like, yeah, this is why he's that that you know Jedi Master that you know everyone kind of fawns over. But I mean, take it Poe for example. I, I love here what you basically got is this idea, the idea of a hotshot uh, space pilot, the jockey, the, the, the guy, the man of action who who will jump into a next wing cockpit and go and blow some shit up, and that is how stuff gets done. And and that has really been the archetypal hero throughout all of Star Wars, be it. Luke Skywalker, Wedge Antilles, Han Solo, Anakin, Obi Wan, uh, whatever the name of that clone trooper that blown up in Revenge of the Sith, you know that, that that's kind of what heroes do, and this is what he does here. But what we're seeing here is the cost. We're seeing yes, you did blow up the dreadnought, but there's a cost associated to that. And even though we know loads of people got blown up and killed in uh, the attack on the Death Star in the first Star Wars film, with um, you know pretty much the entire squadron there, we don't dwell upon that. There's, there's no moment of reflection. They do that, and then, oh, well, here you go, have, have your nice little trophy. La, 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 la. We know from what comes next, though, that's not the end of the story. You know, obviously, though, that was a sanctioned mission, and, you know, they were following orders in that instance. I don't... I, I agree that the, the making mistakes is, is a part of it, but I do not think that is a core theme of this film. We can agree to disagree. We will not. <laughs> we, we will we will have um, but if you Oscar if you look at what other movies are coming out around the same time you had Batman versus Superman which had another very strong theme you know that was the man of it steel was, the man of steel was a new hope um uh, you know and lots and lots of people died and then Batman versus Superman was was a bit like the last jedi and it was about you know admitting that well, the no, huge no, no, no. excuse me no 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 did you just compare the Man of Steel to The Last Jedi. To A New Hope. Zack Snyder's Man of Steel to The Last Jedi. 
I think it's just very you interesting. You are five minutes away from me. I will, I will come over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very interesting that there was a crop of movies around this time that had very, very divisive um, audience opinion, and they had a lot of the same themes of um, looking at your yourself and the amount of damage and loss that your actions cause and I think that's a whole separate conversation in a post-war on terror um, cinematic universe or cinematic space and the stories we're choosing to tell that we had not told before um, but that is not what we're doing now this is that's not the time for this that's that's another time I'm legitimately it, flabbergasted this what just just that just, just that comparison I'm just wow okay <laughs> I mean, you can compare anything to anything. <laughs> That's how comparisons work. Okay, then. Um, get us back on track, because... <laughs> i tell you what, actually. I'll tell, tell, you, tell you what. Here you go. So, so, so here's a point. And again, maybe this is something people struggle with. This is the shortest amount of time between any Star Wars films. And I don't think that helps. No. I mean, I, I understand why it is the case, because I, I, I think what's interesting... Let's take a moment... Let us imagine what what did JJ set up at the end of The Force Awakens? Nobody um, knows. It was in a mystery box. It wasn't a mystery box, but but we, we we can we can comment on what we saw. They destroyed Starkiller Base, although the First Order had destroyed the capital worlds of the New Republic. Um, the, uh, the the remaining fighters uh, had made it back to to the base. Han Solo was dead. Uh, Ray had gone with Chewbacca and apparently R2-D2, to find Luke Skywalker. And at the end of the film, she is there handing out over the lightsaber to Luke Skywalker. I think the expectation was that when we would come back in the next film, time would have passed where then you'd have this sense of Luke had trained Rey and she was, you know, beginning to come into herself as a, as a Force user. And, you know, there was the kind of rise of a Jedi and the Resistance was now much more of a formal rebellion. Um and I can I, I just presume that that's not the story that Ryan Johnson wanted to tell but the problem is if that's not the story you want to tell if you don't want to show Luke is doing that you have to show straight away why he's not doing that so you kind of have to pick it up straight away so you think the issue is that he left it too late into the movie to, to give us the exposition into that uh, who, who JJ or I, um, I, I'm just saying the, the way the film ends with The Force Awakens with Luke holding the lightsaber there's only two ways you can oh I see so, so you think J.J. Abrams should have had some dialogue or literally anything there that, that was like yes I will train you or ah the next Jedi or whatever or some sort of well, do, you, do you recall at the time the expectation on The Last Jedi from that final scene of what would he do next what would he say because I tell you what, absolutely no one had on a bingo card he would throw the lightsaber over his shoulder. Do you know what, though? I laughed again when I saw when it happened. I audibly laughed at it again. And I knew it was coming, and I still found it funny. It's, it's, it's great, because this, this, is, this is a holy icon. This, 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 you, do, you do not throw this away like that. But no, you don't throw Anakin over. fucking Skywalker's lightsaber. I hate that lightsaber so much. Yes, I believe you mentioned that. Uh, you, you don't kill, you, you don't throw youngling killer uh, over your shoulder just like that. But I mean, you remember in the Force Awakens, the entire sequence when she gets it from that box, and you know, all the voices and the echoes and its history, and and you know, it's just, it's just, it's, just, it's, it's the ultimate MacGuffin. And she hands it to him reverently, expectantly, and he takes it and he holds it in his hands and he kind of looks at it and he looks at her, and he just throws it over his shoulder, and it's like. If, if you don't have that moment there, you know, if, if you pick up the film a month, a year later, and Ray's still kind of sleeping outside, knocking on the door, going, let me in, Master Skywalker, it just doesn't work. You kind of have to pick it up at that moment to pay off that setup. I think this is the only Star Wars film that, in canon as well as in real life, takes place so immediately after the one previously. Pretty much, yeah. Um, there, there is an uh, indeterminate amount of time between... I think it's a couple of years between A New Hope and Empire, about the same No, no, we discussed Empire that. And- that was three years, and then it's four years between the next two because they actually kept it to the length between when the movies came out. That was a, a Lucas Fine. decision. And then when you get to the prequel films, obviously uh, there's enough time for Jake Floyd to turn into Hayden Christensen, and then there's enough time for Hayden Christensen to become less incelly. Um <laughs> And for them to 
have a life and stuff. So it's a good couple. Of, yeah, so there's time in between. But this one, this is the only two films where there is no gap in between at all. It is literally moment to yeah. moment, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, speaking of the start, as I said, love the opening crawl. It, I mean, it, 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 it's not a... It's not uh, it's not as great as one of the Force Awakens, but it's a serviceable opening crawl as far as I'm concerned. Considering it takes place literally the next second, mm-hmm. um, I I like uh, I love the opening sequence with the Re- uh, with the Resistance on the run. Um, I'm I'm less keen of the uh, calling Hux bit that, but you know that's, it's, that's, it, it's, it, it it stands out a bit, doesn't it? It's a bit jarring. But equally, we know these are films for kids or you know they have a kid lean to them and see, I, so, 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 can i just jump in there you see that i also think might be an issue with this film and i don't mean an issue is an, i have an issue with it but maybe why so many people didn't do, do, do it. i don't know that this one is a kid's film i mean i watched of all it. of the star wars films of all of the star wars film this one feels the least kiddie i don't disagree but it has kid elements in it like the porgs the porgs are absolutely meant to kind of tick a little bit of the ewok box and i have no issue with them they're great i know they weren't originally planned and it's just to hide the puffins that they weren't allowed to get rid of (laughs) puffins no this is literally a heritage site those puffins have more weight in this world than you do okay just we're gonna cg over some puffins then have a pork um because that is uh, the, the the child that I live with. It's it's special subject. It loves Star Wars and it loves uh, wildlife. And his favourite thing in the world is to know that porgs are actually puffins that they weren't allowed to move because they have sacred revenants to the island. Um, but also the porgs are cute. They mm-hmm. fulfil that Ewok space, don't they? For that for for young kids and they made us laugh. I think as adults, so certainly I found them. Oh, uh, when that one's trying to hit the on switch on the lightsaber and the other one's just kind of staring down the battle. That's <laughs> yeah. it. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think the humour in this is a little dark in places as well. Like, I, I'm not. I I do think that bit with uh, you know General Hugs uh, stands out a little bit. But it's you know it's kind of a ballsy move, isn't it, to just be like, hey, my one Tie Fighter. But but I also just thing. like how it's 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 kind of playing on this idea of Hux, who is you know he projects this air of of trying to be this authoritative kind of you know dictatorous figure you know the head of the army sort of thing and then people undermine him and, and i just love how that kind of you know you've got the captain of a dreadnought who feels like a legitimate um competent officer who realizes straight away that they're shooting his cannons and they should have launched the fighters five minutes ago you know he, he gets that but with hux it, it, it's all about ego and the, the the sense of office you know you even get that moment when he, he sees kylo ren on on the floor sort of thing and you know he you know there's, there's no kind of deliberate motion. He's he's carefully just kind of taking his holster out and then till. Oh, I um, love that. I oh, love yeah. that in the film. That's such a good little. I could just shoot him. Yeah. Um, something I did notice instantly in this film. Um, mm-hmm. We appear to have uh, multiple ages now. No one just looks like they're in their thirties. Uh, just in in terms of the main cast or in terms of. <laughs> Oh, and in in terms of background, like looking at the the people on the dreadnought, oh, yes, and, yes. And like I felt like we now no one was just fresh out of college or you know, in their in their first serious job, first part of their college job. You know, it just yeah. I, I found it really notable in the Force Awakens yesterday that everyone seemed very on the young end. No one had any age, and this one I feel we did have a much better diversity in terms mm-hmm. of a, age of cast in background, and for me that made it feel far more lived in as a space and far more realistic. Um, yeah, I know we justified it yesterday with them being new. Yeah, but no, it's, it, but yeah. it just felt better. Um, yeah, but I love. I love it. I wrote in my notes, holy fuck, big ship. Because <laughs> it was, it was holy fuck a big ship. Like, I really yeah, like I, the entire bombing sequence as well. I like the... Oh, it's a know, war it, film. It, it, it is. It's, 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 pure, it's purely out of World War II. You know, they're doing the bombing run. They're kind of going online. You've got the ball turrets there. You've got the, um, the B-29S cockpits at the front. These things kind of lumbering along. Uh, and, I, and I really like with... Um, uh, Rose's sister, you know, just when you got that, you know, it's the last bomber standing, and Poe's on the comm saying, you know, you got to drop the bombs, you're the last one standing, and you know, the, the sacrifice and, and the way that whole sequence is done, I really, really like it. I mean, it's it's kind of a tragic shame we haven't learned any more about that character in any of the spin-off media or anything like that. It's it's just she, she was there to die to motivate Rose, but it was just such a well done sequence. I really enjoyed it. 
I really enjoyed it as well. And I know this one uh, has the most practical effects of all the sequels. Um, and the bomber was entirely practical effects and they only had a bit of um, blue screen for when the doors open and underneath it. But mm -hmm. the rest of it was all real and it did feel real. This again, this to me felt like a war film um, in lots of places. And this sequence at the start really felt like a war film. Yeah. And then we go to Leia, who's looking fly as fuck in that outfit. Whatever shit J.J. Abrams put her in to make her look like a frumpy grandma in The Force Awakens, she was back. She was looking like the Leia we know. And yeah. she was the boss bitch in charge. And I loved it. I thought that was... I thought, actually, having watched this... This this film for me is so bittersweet because I love Carrie Fisher um, and her impact on cinema and everything else. And this is so bittersweet that this is her last film. And I feel she'd have been given a very different role if they'd had any idea this was going to be her last film. Like, it was such a surprise when she died. Um, and I think... I think her role in this is brilliant. And I think it's the biggest shame is that she died so she didn't get her film, which was the third one. Um, but we'll come to that tomorrow because I have really fucking strong feelings on that film. <laughs> um, but she is she is perfect in this. No notes. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, no I, I love... Notes. I no love notes. what she's wearing in, in, in this. And, and she feels like Leia as well. She didn't really feel like Leia in The Force Awakens, I felt. It, it felt much, very much like Carrie Fisher was kind of fulfilling a cameo whereas in this film it felt like Leia it, it made sense I, I, and I love just the, the interaction between her and Poe like you know they do the initial bit of a plan sort of thing and uh, she's like that's great okay you've got to go and when he says no we're going to go and uh, take down this dreadnought and you can you can see that she's like I've lost too many people doing this sort of stuff you, you reach a point in your life when yeah no, you've got to look at the bigger picture and you've got to save the lives that you have. There's only like, what was it? At the start of this, 400 people in the resistance. Well, uh, I think there were the 600. He lost about 150. And then when they got onto the shuttles to run away, they were down to 400. Mm. And then they got less than 100 to... I think it's about 40 at the end, isn't it? It's, it's enough to fit in the Falcon anyway. Uh, yeah, and um, do you know what, though? I felt it through this movie. I really felt that the resistance was dwindling and they mm -hmm. were really... Str like, th this film makes me feel anxiety, is what I realised. Yeah. Um, and I'm used to shows giving me anxiety. We all watch For All Mankind, the biggest anxiety <laughs> show of the world. Um, but... I really felt in this that they were struggling and you know in Empire they do a lot of jumping from you know they're on the run and they're jumping from place to place to place to place I felt that in this one but there was so much more weight because she'd been doing it now for so long I felt mm -hmm. her her wisdom of age and her I felt her sense of loss as you say when she's telling Poe not to do it and he goes and does it that's the difference of age isn't it Mm -hmm. I felt I felt our original cast in this were allowed to be old people. Yes, but not old people in 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 a derogatory sense. Old, old in a sense of they're, they're allowed to have lived a life. They're allowed to have yes, that wisdom. Exactly. Yeah, and, and and I think that comes across from both Leia and from from Luke in this film in a way that I don't feel that uh, Han got to have in The Force Awakens. Han got to be just a bit of a, a pa telling his kid, you know, do the right thing. Well, Han was very much a um, an absentee dad who's just come back into a kid's life, <laughs> and it's mm. just like, hey, we can hey, do the kid, fun stuff. <laughs> if we go play ball and catch, it'll be okay, right? Yeah. No, dad. <laughs> um, yeah. It, I don't know if Han Solo would have fitted in this film, though. I know he was already dead. I know they he'd already been killed off, but I'm not sure where he would have fitted, even if he well, hadn't if been killed off. It, 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 it wouldn't have been this film if, if, if he was there. They would have done some, some changes, some tweaks to it, what have you. Um, let's talk about Poe a little bit. I really love how Oscar Isaacs portrays Poe in this film. Uh, because it feels like he's he, found the character in this film. Well, it, it, he's found a character, but also it, it, it's, it's an interesting take on a character that we just haven't seen before. Once again, you know, outside of Star Wars even, you know, 
think of like Maverick in Top Gun. You know, think think of those sort of characters. It, it is the it is the rash flyboy who who's a man of action who wants to get to the front and wants to take charge and wants to go and give it a bloody nose. And that's just not working here. And it's frustrating him. And I love the sequence when Holdo and he kind of goes up and goes, "Hey, I'm uh, Commander Dameron. So uh, what's the plan?" And the way Holdo just goes, um, "It's it's Captain Dameron, though, isn't it?" Because Leia's isn't last the thing last thing Leia ever did to demote you. Hmm. Yeah. I I but love I know she's a very divisive character I love her we'll get to her let's focus yeah Poe but, I but, love that interaction but, but, but my point is there what I like here is you have this sense of yeah you're presenting the resistance as a military organisation or a power military organisation whatever, whatever you want to call it in, in such then there's a chain of command and it is not beholden on an admiral to explain themselves to uh, to their subordinates you know you, you enact a plan you enact a strategy and then your subordinates are there to do it and if they don't like it well it's basically tough shit you just, that's what you signed up for if it's not an illegal order you go through with it and and i like how a lot of people will turn around and say oh well you know if only she'd explain to him uh, what was going on maybe he'd been on board that that's not how it works it doesn't work like that <laughs> But also, he hadn't earned the right to know. You know, mm-hmm. Leia had given him instruction. He had disobeyed them. Why would the new leader um, or the temporary leader give him any instruction? Um, because he clearly is unable to follow them. And I, her plan or the plan, I don't think it was hers. I think this was the fail-safe plan that they had in place. You know, that was really need to know, in my opinion, because that is that is a risky plan i'm not sure what else they could have done though you know they they were being tracked they couldn't jump anywhere they couldn't do anything um they had one she had one shot to get this thing right this this plan right and the more people that knew about it the more risky that plan became um but i think again this is not something we've seen in star wars before and i think that's what rubbed people up the wrong way and rubbed that character up the wrong way is because she withheld information from the audience as well I think if the audience had known the plan I think it would not have served the film any justice but I think if I think more audience would have more acceptance of the plan if we'd known what the plan was and it was just being hidden from the character but also she she wasn't wearing proper military attire though so you know that's very important we have I to be love clear. how feminine she was I love how <laughs> how she invoked all the layer kind of floaty dress stuff from the original series you know she was very she was a military leader in a resistance but she could still be feminine and she didn't have to wear a military suit because they're a resistance they're not even a rebellion they're a resistance you know they are still wearing hodgepodges of outfits from the Republic or their own club. You know, there's lots of odd bits going on in here. There's no cohesiveness like we saw to the, rebe- to the Rebellion. The thing is, though, for all we know, she is wearing a military outfit. That could be the fucking military outfit for bloody Pyphus 2 or wherever the hell she comes from, you know? We have no idea. We're just kind of applying our own expectations over that. Uh, exactly. But it's just it's a ridiculous complaint. And the other one that I've heard before... Um, is is people complaining about how, oh, well, why are they running out of fuel? Why is that an issue? Because we've never seen that before in Star Wars. Well, well, I have been making notes throughout this. In A New Hope, we see X-Wings and all that being refueled. What do you think those hoses are for pulling out of the X-Wings? That's fuel. In Empire Strikes Back, when um, they escape from a Star Destroyer, they talk about can they make it to... Um, to Bespin, to the Lando system. Uh, Lando's not a system, he's a guy. Uh, But they wonder if they've got enough fuel to do that. And in The Phantom Menace, the reason they have to stop in Tatooine is because the hyperdrive is is leaking and it will be out of fuel. That's three instances where fuel is an issue in Star Wars. I feel you have been waiting for this series that we're doing now to be able to bring this point up. The only reason I agreed to do this. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Also, you cut this use- out of the edit, I'm coming for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> ships use fuel. I'm not sure what people were thinking there. Like, I had I had no... It, there was no suspension of disbelief. Big ship uses fuel. Big ship on run uses more fuel. Big ship on run from bigger ship that can track it running out of fuel. I don't see any way that that's complicated. That's a really, really simple... And really easy cinematic device. It gave us time scales. It gave us location scales. It... It added to the tension. It was simple and brilliant. I don't see the problem. 
the thing is, I mean, th- 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 there are lots of things about this where you go, well, why didn't they just jump ahead of them? Or, you know, they could have done this, they could have done that. I mean, yeah, you could have done that. But throughout all of Star Wars, I mean, why didn't the Death Star just fire through the planet at Yavin? You know? They could do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> so leaving the Resistance aside for a moment... Uh, we spend some time with Luke. This is the first time in a long time we've heard the Jedi called a religion, and he calls them a religion. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people um, have expressed they do not like this characterization of Luke. And, and Mark Hamill himself, I've seen in interviews, has said that when he first got the script, he said, I didn't agree with any of the decisions and choices that were being made for Luke at the time uh, what people tend to forget though is at the end of that interview he then says now having made the film and seen the output I, I see it I get it I'm 100% behind it but what I think is really interesting here is it takes Luke Skywalker Jedi Knight saviour of the galaxy and it reminds us all that this is also a man who lived an entire sheltered life on Tatooine who saw his uh, guardians uh, bodies murdered before him and then went through some pretty traumatic stuff for quite a while and and just reached a point i i I love this characterization of luke because it feels human it feels believable it feels like yeah if i'd gone through some of that stuff i'd probably want to go and hide on a planet on my own to be perfectly honest but also that's what his two jedi masters did Yes, you see, he went to the Jedi school of what you do. When things go wrong, you exile yourself to a planet. You don't deal with these problems. You don't go and see a therapist. You go and exile yourself. That is what Obi-Wan Kenobi did um, under Yoda's orders. And that's what Yoda did. You know, he is is doing as his predecessors did, rightly or wrongly. Probably wrongly. Calcestis did it as well. (laughs) Yeah, that is true. Calcestis did also do it. Mm -hmm. And we're not really sure what Ahsoka's done, I guess... She fucked off for a bit, but she wasn't a Jedi, so it doesn't count. Neither yeah. was Cal Kestis, but <laughs> whichever. Um, but no, he calls it a religion, and I think that's really interesting that this is the film that does it. I think this is the one where the Jedi feel most like a religion, mm-hmm. and also the one where we get... You know, she's not a Jedi by the end of this, by a very, very, very long way. She is very, very... She's done the most basic bit of training. You know, she is less trained when she goes to see Kylo Ren than Luke was when he first went off to face Vader in The Empire Strikes Back. I'm mm-hmm. not mad about that. I just that is, it is very noticeable. He did not train her. Um, I think the stuff with Luke is. I think I prefer the stuff with the Resistance, um, but I don't dislike any of the stuff with Luke at all by a long way. Um, it's just I love for me, the secret. I, I love the sequence when he's explaining to Ray what the Force is. I mean, firstly, I just love that whole little thing with a leaf and go, reach out, do you feel it? Do you feel it? It's the Force. You must be really strong with it. Smack. Oh, you meant. But when he's talking about it, you know, you know, using your feelings, this felt like the anti midichlorian film because this is the best description of a Force we've had since but Yoda also, says they it's the energy that binds us. <laughs> I know. Everyone hated it. So why are we now annoyed that they've given us an alternative explanation to the midichlorians? I'm not. Like, I'm in favour of it. <laughs> no, I know. But like the wider, the wider public, as it were, you know, we hated this film. But we hated midichlorians. Well, this one undoes midichlorians. Well, I hate it. And it's like, oh, for fuck's sake, this film couldn't win. This film could never win because I don't fucking know why. Misogyny, sexism. No, I don't I, know. See, I, I, I will say this. I, I think a, I, I think a lot of this was to do with the time this film came out. And and if you look at the nature of internet discourse at the time, I think this film is no more... Um, uh, I was going to say revolutionary, but that's a wrong word. But, but this film doesn't change the canon or the dynamic of the film that came previously any more than The Empire Strikes Back does. I, I think... Uh, if, if you were to do side by side changes that you get in, in terms of uh, Star Wars from A New Hope to Empire and then changes from The Force Awakens to The Last Jedi, I, I would place money that there are more changes and a more dramatic shift between Empire and, and Star Wars. I think the difference being, though, is when this came out, there was social media and there was this entire infrastructure of finger quoting, the fandom menace, where people had decided prior to this that they didn't like 
Star Wars, they didn't like Kathleen Kennedy, they didn't like Daisy Ridley, they didn't like these choices, and it just disappeared into this massive echo chamber. And the other problem you now have, though, is when people who do not like this film for legitimate reasons, be it, you know, they don't like pacing, they don't like tone, they don't like characterization, they find themselves being very defensive because they find themselves being lumped in with the worst scum of the internet. And it just means you can't have a discussion like this without it eventually falling down to you're a Nazi, you fucking hate women, uh, you know, you're just a corporate shrill, you just love anything Disney puts out. It, ju- it just descends rapidly into this utter ball of hate that is just tiring. And it makes it so you just don't want to engage. I don't disagree. And I have no issue if people don't like this film for, as you say, legitimate reasons, either the pacing or it's just not a story they're particularly that interested in. I, I really like the performances from both Adam Driver and from Daisy Ridley here. And, and I really like the whole forced didact thing, you know, where they're kind of connected. And I, I like how it's done, kind of done. It, it's kind of, uh, it, it builds progressively throughout the film. Neither of them particularly know what's what happens uh, I, I like the first time that it happens and kind of you know Kylo tries to mind trick her and then realises that's just not going to work um, and then there's that great one later on when she's like ah, I'd really rather not do this right now and he's like yeah me too and then she's like can you just put a top on or something and he's just standing there with his shirt off and it's just <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't think about how awkward it could be if you could suddenly connect minds with someone at the most inopportune moment um, but I really like the characterization between the two um, and, and you know that culminating in that scene in the throne room which for me is is in one of the top moments in all of star wars i absolutely love the build-up to that snoke i, I love I, again some amazing cg on the part of snoke and a great performance from andy circus but you know just how assured he is and how, and how he you know he's in control he knows exactly what's going on he's an extremely powerful yours force user you have no sense that um, you know when Palpatine used to say everything is proceeding as I have foreseen there was always a little bit of okay you know that's a little little bit cocky a little bit cocksure you know sort of thing feeling like you have to say this with Snoke you really did feel like he had a, a, a good strong grasp of the situation and what's going on and then just seeing how you know Kylo slowly turns the lightsaber towards him while Snoke is monologuing. He twists his lightsaber, he rises up, he strikes down his enemy, and then the lightsaber ignites. And I just love that entire sequence. It's just fantastic. That whole battle is top tier. I love that battle. I know people said it was too choreographed. Fuck off, disagree. It's beautiful. That's cinema. That's It, it felt... It felt a bit Kill Billy to me, you know, some of the fight sequences in that, you know, it's highly stylized, but it's lightsabers. I'm not sure what you're expecting here. Oh, the big red backdrop as well, which then catches fire and got these bits of red material falling down. All the while, the legs of Snoke are still sitting in his throne. I think... The cinematography and the, the 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 still images you could take. There's hundreds of still images from this. I feel every every frame in this is art in its own right. Yeah. And I think, you know, we spoke about how some of the other films are some of the most beautiful. I hate to say it, I actually think this is. Oh no! I this, think- this, this is easily the best looking. The, the cinematography in this film is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so this, the cinematography of this was done by uh, Steve Yedlin, and this is the only Star Wars film that he's done. Uh, and oh my god, it is absolutely amazing. What else As you say, he you could, uh, he's done Glass Onion, Knives Out, San Andreas. Um, Carrie, Looper, a lot of stuff with Ryan Johnson, obviously. Um, but none of those I would yeah. particularly think of for cinematography, bizarrely. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I think what's key here is, as you said, any almost any frame of this film, you could take it as a, a work of art to hang on your wall. It's just utterly achingly beautiful i mean my background on my computer from the moment this film came out was from crate um and the speeders pulling the red uh, we'll get to that because oh the the yeah the end battle is amazing um there's not a huge amount of of oh, i say there's not a huge amount of of starfighter battles there is there is quite a bit in this we spend a lot of time in ships mm-hmm. and the fact that we're in ships being important um we've got the little well, battle of I, I really like the moment when Ben, you know, you know, after having been given this dressing down from Snoke, who told him to take off that childish mask, and I loved the way he just destroys that mask into the turbo lift. You know, it's just utterly ruins it, which again feeds into this sense of 
you have to let go of this past and, the, and these childish things. You know, this, 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 is, this is a grown-up thing. You are not playing as being Darth Vader, which is what he had been doing. And and then he's on the ship and he's just utterly decimating the ship. And when it flies into the hangar and blows up all of those fighters, and that A-Wing pilot who, you know, you feel like, oh, that's going to be a major character in this. It's like, nope, she dead. Oh, um, and I was really sad she died. Like, but yeah. We've set, met her like three times. That was it. We hadn't had a huge amount of time with her, but I was, I was, she felt like a human loss to us, you know, a, a, a loss, which was important. You know, mm-hmm. it tied in with some of the wider themes. Um, but you're about to say the shot where Poe Dameron is looking at his burnt X-Wing and all the flames, because that shot is amazing. Well, I was actually going to say the, 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 the bit where the explosion, he gets thrown out of the, um, the hangar and then BB-8 just comes bouncing by and then his head goes back the other way. <laughs> It's a serious moment, but just a little touch of levity in, in, in there as well. It's just, it was just great. Uh, one of the big uh, controversial points in this film, uh, of I'd say the two most controversial points, but let's talk about the first one. That is uh, General Leia, uh, Carrie Fisher, using some Jedi Force powers we've never seen before, except we have. Um, how, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about her uh, flying back into the ship? So I remember... Uh, you know, obviously going into this film, but we, we'd known that Carrie had passed away. And when when that happened, uh, I, I honestly thought that they were going to kill her off in that moment. It was like, oh, wow, you're going to kill Leia off right there and then? Uh, and I was, I was just a bit shot. And then, and then seeing her going through the thing. I don't have an issue with her using that force power, and I don't have an issue with it being her who has done it. I think what lets this down is it's probably the weakest visual effects in the entire film it just feels and I don't know if this is uh, from a camera placement point of view or how the camera tracks it or, or, or I, I don't know why but that visual effect is, is very weak for me so I think it's weak until she gets inside the the, the ship yeah yeah her, her, her flying through space is the weak bit for me exactly and it just feels a little I mean the, the joke was it was Mary Poppinsy and it's it is it's true. It feels a bit like that. But once again, it's no less ridiculous than some any of the other stuff that we've seen in in Star Wars. I mean, the super speed and bloody the Phantom Menace. Um, just some of the jumps that we've seen Luke do in the past, like when he jumps out from the um, the carbon chamber in um, in Bespin. Yeah, where he jumps yeah. like twelve foot in the air and no one says anything, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I just feel that. It, it, the execution isn't great. I don't have any issues with the force power. And also, she's the daughter of Anakin Skywalker, the single most powerful Jedi that ever was, or of all that ever was. Um, and it, this comes back to a, a thing. I've, I've had arguments with people, mostly about Star Trek here as well, is there's this sense that if you don't see it, it didn't happen. It's been, what was what did we say? It's like 30 years since the end of Return of a Jedi at this point? 35? Yep. The thought that in that entire time, she would not have done any training or exploration of her force powers or anything like that so Um, that was my biggest disappointment with the force awakens is we didn't see any jedi stuff from leia you know we were the force awakens i did leia a massive dirty as far as i'm i did lots of people are dirty but leia particularly she was just a mother and han solo's partner is is how it felt um but in this she definitely got to be more of a jedi she was a different type of jedi um but I felt like she was a force user in this, certainly. And I think, okay, I agree. The graphics on her outside the ship was not great. I think she was too far away from the ship is my problem. I think if she was closer, it would be more believable. Um, but I think it's how far she had to travel that made it look a bit ridiculous. Um, but... I have no issue with the concept of it happening or the premise of it happening or the fact she could do the thing. I just don't think it was visually the best way it could have been done. Um, but, you know, it's it's hammy space opera, you know, it's, it's, it's fucking laser swords and mind tricks. You know, you're telling me she can't survive in the vacuum of space for 10 seconds? Really? You it was know, a bit longer than 10 seconds. <laughs> But why is why is that the hill to die on of all the Jedi powers we see get used? And I'm sorry, but we had fucking magic healing in the next movie. Um, oh, it's, it's okay. But people didn't like that film either. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, we've got these <clears throat> we've got this Jedi bond connection stuff happening. You know, we've introduced um, believable, in my opinion, force 
powers and I don't think her survival is is anything and you know she, it's not as if she walks in and she's hi guys I'm fine you know she's she's in a, a coma or whatever for to start with well, I mean, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we've both been watching for all mankind. Um, I've watched the Expanse as well, both of which have instances where people s- exist in a vacuum of space. Sometimes they even survive. So that well, that's not for all mankind, is it? I said sometimes they survive. But my, my point is people who complain go, oh, that's unrealistic, but you should be able to do this. Once again, long time ago, galaxy far, far away, space wizards, talking Muppets. That being said, I think just in terms of uh, in, in the story in the moment, you know, when you had that sense that um, Ben was going to fire the missile and doesn't and the other two missiles go and the way you see the explosion and everyone kind of gets sucked out of the room in, in that thing, that all is, is very, very powerful. It's just that Mary Poppins-esque moment. We agree that could have been better executed, but we have no issue with the principle of it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Big point of contention, which is the casino planet. Now, ah, in my, in my, <laughs> so in my memory, this is much longer than it actually is. When I was watching it, I was really surprised how little time that we actually spend on this planet or in this space. Um, and I'm really not sure what all the hate was for it. It it felt well paced. It made sense within the in the story. Um, it was yet again our heroes are oh, we can't get to the one we want. This one will do. Someone else has told us the thing. Um, I, ha- I had no issue with this whatsoever. I thought it was a very Star Wars-y sequence. This, this, I, much like yourself, I, my memory of this was that my, it's a much longer sequence than it actually is in here. I, thought it, was good, take- I thought it was a good half the film was, was with Rose and, po, uh, Rose and Finn off on this planet doing stuff. And it's like 10 minutes? Maybe fifteen. It's much less than I thought it was. Mm. But uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to take a moment and uh, acknowledge that opening shot that you have there. That uh, I can't remember what the name of it is, uh, but it's 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 you know, the opening shot when it's kind of tra- cameras traveling in over casino tables and everything, until you get that bit where Finn, Finn shows up there. It, it's heavily um, inspired from a nineteen twenties silent film, uh, and it's just a really really well shot sequence there i mean i think before we get to canto bite maybe we should talk a bit about finn because I, I i was speaking to you about this last night um john boyega does not like this film or at the very least he keeps prod- prodding it and, and saying this is the film of, of the three that you know he likes the least um and, and he's not been a huge i mean he, that being said he's not a huge fan of his experience working on any of these but this is the one that he kind of points to as his least favorite and he complains that Adam Driver and Daisy Ridley got uh, a lot more opportunities for nuance uh, in in these films and and to do stuff here. I don't get that because Finn has a lot to do in this film and I think he is great in it. I really do think John Boyega brings a lot of the heart to this film in in, in what he's doing here. I don't... The only thing I can assume that he's not happy about is they kind of just drop the pretense of Finn becoming the next... Force user or, or or a Jedi, you know that's kind of completely dropped. I wonder if he is unhappy at how comedic his stuff is compared to the others. You know, Ray and uh, Kylo Ren is not their stuff is not for comedy. Um, they get a lot of gravitas, <clears throat> while Finn, you know, starts off yet again running away as a traitor, which is how he started the last film. Um, he goes on this journey, um, which a lot of that is where the humour of the film comes from, I guess. And then he ends up, um, not saving the day, um, because someone stops him doing it. So, I guess he could be disappointed with that. I really liked Finn in this. I really liked the story of him and Rose. I really love Rose as a character and the fucking shit that she was put through as as an actor, as a human being by the general public is disgusting. Oh, yeah. Um, and the fact she was written out of the next film is equally disgusting. Oh, um, yeah. 
but I she's think... great. She is. She she's great in this film. Uh, she, she brings a lot to it. I I love her her journey and her story. I mean, from the very first moment when you see her, kind of you know, she, she's upset. She's distraught at the loss of her sister, and then she finds this 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 person that she admires. She looks up to is is trying to sneak away, and it's the way you get this sense of disappointment when she realizes what he's trying to do, but without missing a beat, just tases him. I thought I was great. <laughs> I thought Rose and Frim were a great pairing. Uh, I'm disappointed that John Boyega is so is so disparaging of this movie. But as you say, he's disparaging of all of Star Wars. And I think, I think now, I don't he was, blame him because he, it, from, from, from the sounds of it, he had a terrible time in in this. He he was sold something that was then not delivered. You know, he he was brought on. He was he was told, uh, you know, ha- having a black character it was going to be very much at the forefront. Uh, you know, a, a Jedi story or something along these lines, and it just didn't come to pass so i don't i don't blame him for being upset about it but i do feel that uh, he, he strikes me as someone that likes to stir the pot and i oh yeah massively <laughs> yeah and um and and so you know i will take a grain of salt but i i just think in this film I, I think he's a lot better in this film than he was in force awakens um and i really liked uh him and um rose uh, Kelly Marie trans uh, uh scenes together I, I thought that was great and it's just seeing him starting to see this wider universe it's that realization you know they all talk about we're going to the worst place in the galaxy so we're all there meant to be thinking oh we're going to like a moss high sleep place or a wretched hive of scum and villainy but yeah no this this is the worst place and and let me tell you as someone who has gone and filmed in places like this and interacted with people like this yeah these are the fuckers this is the shit it's 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 not the the gambling dens and the smugglers and you know the people just trying to live their lives out of the way. It is the people who are profiting from this shit. And I loved the fact that we were shown, you know, oh, I stole this shit from someone. What did they sell? Oh, they sold to the Empire. Oh, but they also sold to the the Resistance. Uh, John Boyega does not get to be a Jedi in this. I'm sad that he didn't get to do a little bit of Force stuff in there. I think that could have been quite nice uh, to see him, you know. Um, rig a gambling unintentionally or intentionally rig a gambling table or something or or connect to the the creatures in a force way um would have been a nice hint but the film didn't need it it would just be nice for for the character um and i do think it's a shame that he has his force sensitivity is not touched on at all however that is not the story that was being told here um and they were on a doomed mission I, I, I like how they feel very reminiscent of the stuff that we were seeing in the prequels. It feels very much like a cross between Coruscant and Naboo. And it, that kind of feeds back into the sense that those prequels were, you know, a bit of a decadent time, weren't they? You know, there was a reason why the Separatists were wanting to leave. There was a reason why Palpatine was able to rise to power outside of just his machinations and all this. It was because stuff like this was existing under the surface, as it does in our world. And I think... People might say, oh, well, it's a little bit on the nose. It's like, yeah, but apparently you can't read subtext. So, yeah, it has to be on the nose, doesn't it? I mean, this this sequence, especially in this movie, gave me real anti-capitalism vibes, um, which I'm not against. But it really it really did. You know, this all this wonderful lifestyle is built on the suffering of children and animals. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, they didn't. That That was... That was not subtext. That was just straight out text for you to that read right text. there yeah. on, the, on the screen. <laughs> um, and I think people found that uncomfortable. That is not what they want from their Star Wars, uh, which is ironic because the original Star Wars, particularly the second and the third movies, did have a lot of those elements in and did have a lot of you know uh, introspection on on current life and and society. So they don't want it because the sequels didn't, the prequels didn't have it. Is very much my feeling. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think that's a valid way to, to read it. I mean, and, and once again, this comes back to why I'm saying that this is a film which is a deconstruction because it is forcing people to look at their prejudices and, and their preconceived notions about what this film should be and what your understandings of it, of it should be. It, it's like, uh, I know if, uh, sometime last year there was this whole thing going around where someone had suddenly come to the realisation that the judges from Judge Dredd were the baddies. Oh, and that if was you went a bad day. It, but, but then if you went and read the guy's um, uh, Reddit post there, he starts talking about how he'd always supported the Empire because, you know, they're just trying to bring law and order and the rebels are there being, you know, terrorists. And it's... It's, it's like I mean, people look, watching the boys and deciding Homelander's the hero. 
exactly that. And, and I and I think a lot of the time we, we look at things and we say, oh, that's a bit on the nose. And, you know, it, you know, you're spelling it out a bit clearly. But that's because we're expecting a level of film literacy from people that maybe is just not there. So sometimes maybe you do literally have to kind of just hold it up and just say, here's the text. Do, do you get it yet? Do you get it yet? But even in this film, I, I feel what it's doing is it's, it's doing it in a subversive way where it's leading you to that conclusion. I think Finn is very much a insert character for the viewers there when he first arrives on Canto but it's amazing with the lights and the sounds and the colours and everything and it's so cool and it's amazing and it's only when Rose explains to him the truth of what's there beneath the surface that he comes to realise he goes oh no we're in a bad place here and big shout out BB-8 who takes over as MVP, MVP droid in this series for, for everything he does in this sequence because he is a fucking delight and I love the fact that BB-8 is a practical droid and I love the fact that when he shoots the coins um, out you know that's a that's a real practical effect that's not CG and they had yeah. to rig, rig a, they had to make a droid and rig it to do that um, BB-8 is still a delight in in this sequel um, series and I was worried that I'd find them quite contrite but I think they were just over marketed um, you know that was the cute little marketed droid a lot um, but as an entity in this I love I love them they're great mm-hmm. they're fun um, and I love the fact that they they switch ownership as it were you know they go off with Finn they go with Poe they had a bit with Ray in the last one you know they're not exclusively one person's droid they don't have a like a set partnership um i, I, I really like the bit when when they, when they get back to resistance base and and they go don't shoot it, it's not us and the first thing pogo goes is where's my droid and he's just so happy to see him <laughs> he's like buddy and gives him a little rub no it's so yeah. cute um okay so we are getting closer to the 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 third big controversy oh the holdo maneuver I feel that that is the, the nitpickiest of the nitpicking that has ever been picked at nicks because firstly can i just say what an amazing sequence that is, just, just visually and audibly. And, and just in, in, in the execution of that sequence, have you ever heard a silence that deafening in the cinema? I don't think I have. I, I, visually, I viscerally remember being in the cinema when that happened and it being utterly silent. And it was just such a powerful moment. And then the explosion afterwards. It was afterwards. an oh fuck moment. I love it. It's absolutely absolutely amazing and once again you get people turning around and saying well why couldn't they do that before and all this well, they have done it before Hera does it in Rebels which I think came after this but besides the point here my two my two takeaways from that are firstly um, it, it, it seems to kill people which would be very bad you know you don't necessarily want to do it but secondly if, if you're that worried about the minutia and law where you have to go and justify it if you go and read the technical manuals they explain the reason that the cruiser was able to do it is because of its shields it wasn't the ship itself. It was its shields, which kind of projected through. I don't know all the ins and outs of it. It's made up bullshit. Of course it's made up bullshit. But it, 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 once again, if this is the hill you're going to die on, you have this amazing sequence and how that's done, and you go and like, break it. The thing is, though, so here's the thing. I can almost guarantee you, in fact, I will guarantee you, that if it wasn't Holdo doing this, if they'd have used Admiral Akbar to do this, no one would have had any fucks about it. Right, so that's the big complaint people have said, is why was this not Admiral Akbar getting his moment? He was a big I, character in the background. I'm sorry. I, I, think, I, I think his moment was when he said, it's a trap. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. I, I, I suspect why people have an issue with this. Um, I think it's the... Uh, it's. <laughs> It's visually so striking and so stunning. I think it's one of the postmodern's greatest uh, shots in cinema, and I don't say that lightly. Um, it's so unexpected as well for the story that we're being told. Well, it's not unexpected for the story we're being told, but it's 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 such an unexpected decision in Star Wars, I guess, where we blow up ships all the time, um, and it has such an impact. You know, Literally. that is... <laughs> yeah, literally. But it has such a It's visceral. It's visceral, it is. isn't it? I can't yeah. even I can't even put into words how it's making me feel, but it's other than it's phenomenal. And you know, they're all boarding the transporters and Leia says, you know, come on, and she's like, No, someone's got to someone's got to pilot the ship. And we've seen that all the way through and you know when the the frigate goes and the medical vessel go. Um, mm-hmm. She's talking to them as they're getting blown up and oh that that hits. Holdwell's taking the you know 
the weight of those captains. The captain goes down with the ship and her other captains have gone down with their ship. She is the admiral or vice admiral. She is in charge and she goes down with her ship. That is warfare and that is naval warfare particularly. And that is what this is supposed to be. And she is doing everything she can to protect her people. And the way you protect your people is you take out the bad guys and you do that any way possible. She has one shot at doing it. She has one opportunity and she takes it. I don't give a shit. It was a ship or the shields or whatever. It was fucking amazing and no notes. Mm. But that was... Um, I, 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 I ranted just, there. <laughs> you did, but, you know, it's, it's a moment that was just utterly spectacular and... You know, sometimes, you know, I'll just throw it on bloody YouTube just to watch it because it's so cool. So you're just seeing that, that moment, the, the colours, it goes black and white, the silence. Uh, and then the, boom, um, the, the sound of like a, a F1 car going past, or uh, mm. that's when it's meant to invig- uh, invoke, isn't it? That speed just... Well, you know, you, we, we know the sound effect of Star Wars ships going to hyper. Uh, hyper speed you know we, we've heard the you know when they're charging the, the capacitors and it, it, it kind of raises in pitch and then you get the star effect and then you just have it, it's the way it hits the um uh snoke ship and then everything just kind of cascades away from it and all the ships behind it are just split in half just utterly bisected and i love that it was um foreshadowed by leia floating through the uh the ship uh hologram earlier on mm-hmm. i think that's such a such a small nuance throwback that you expect from high quality cinema, which is what this is. Um, As you know, listeners may know, I, I wrote a, a, a Star Trek fan fiction book about the Battle of Wolf 359 recently. And one of the things I got repeatedly was people telling me that ship wasn't there or, or that ship wouldn't have been involved in 359 or that ship came later. And, you know, just, just telling me I was outright wrong about a lot of this stuff. To which my response generally was, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realise you were there. Because that, that's kind of the point. It, it's, it's fictional, it's make-believe. It can be whatever you want it to be. And so, no, no fiction, no make-believe. Only hardcore facts as written in 32 <laughs> off-brand books by George yeah. Lucas in the 80s. <laughs> George Lucas didn't like any of them, but yeah. Um, what did I want to talk about? So let's go, let's go back to, um, uh, to, to to Luke and and the training of Ray, which you know I, I really like his characterization of the um, of what the Force is, and you know I mean, just his life as a hermit, as as we said, you know he's very much taking the um, the Yoda school of of what you do when when you you feel you failed and, and you go off into exile. Uh, this sense that he's trying to build up the courage himself to go and end it, to go and burn down the tree there, but you know he just he just can't bring himself to do it because deep down Luke was always a fanboy about this sort of thing, you know. So I, I love that depiction he got going on there, and the way he he he, he legitimately fears Ray, or rather what Ray could become. In, in, in that you know, when they have that first thing he goes you went straight towards the dark you didn't you didn't hesitate you went straight there and I've, I've only seen that raw power once before and I wasn't scared of it then I am now I, I really liked that we we see what I mean it, it shows us in this film why Luke is out there on an island on his own oh yeah it doesn't um, it doesn't shy away from his past misactions um, and I think the fact that he's wary about Ray right the way until the end you know she, he never really gives his blessing for her to to learn or do more I know he trains her a little bit or starts some lessons three lessons three lessons yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's Yodavo, no... it's, it's Yodavo that does it in the end when he says I taught you know you, you didn't hear my lessons um, you know you have uh, you know, you, you, you've you know everything you need to know, and and we need to make sure that she does. It's it's Yoda which basically tells him that. God, God damn it, Luke! What the fuck? <laughs> I love the section with the tree. I think that's really well done. I love the fact that she's just nicked the books already. Oh yeah. Um, but I love I love Yoda. Mm, page turners were they? Yeah. <laughs> page turners they were not. Read them, did you? I love oh, that. It's... Absolute I, call out of oh, um, it's, it's hitting him, off, hitting him on the nose with his walking stick, and goes, you know, always, all, always on the horizon, never on it here and now, and just echoing those lessons for, from um, Empire. It, I, I like how in that instance Luke goes from grisly old Jedi Master into a close back to that boy who's just crashed his X-wing there, who doesn't really know what he's doing. In an instant, that's where he is, and that's great. It's so beautifully done. And to me, that's the right way to homage 
the past and where this came from in a way that The Force Awakens didn't manage to do. The Force Awakens tried and made a fan film. This was the real homage to to the films that came before it. Um, and I actually think that's a case for this whole film as it homage is much better. You know, as we say with the casino stuff is very much from the prequels and, you know, you've got Yoda being very much how he is in, in Empire and there's a lot of feeling of the original and the prequels within this film. I think it takes all that legacy in history and really bakes it well and I think Yoda's a really good example of how that works in this film. Uh, I, 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 I would say that... I, I think what you have here is you have Ryan Johnson and J.J. Abrams, I think, are two creators who both love Star Wars and, and they both have a huge affinity for it. But I think the difference is J.J. Is Abrams wants to... <laughs> how, how can I express this? He, 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 he's trying to make his version of what's gone before, whereas what Ryan Johnson is going is he's trying to convey to you what are the important messages in it that he sees and, 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 and try and pass those on to you. And I think... Abrams is very much, you know, it's, it's imitation and repetition to kind of get a point across. Whereas with uh, Ryan Johnson, it's about innovation and and telling new stories in in a new way. And I think that's why I find The Last Jedi so much more personally satisfying to watch and engage with. The Last Jedi is a film that I will happily just put on without any connection to any of the others. I might just say, you know, I'm going to stick on The Last Jedi, and I could do that. I could watch it. It has a for me a nice defined beginning, middle and end I find very satisfying whereas with The Force Awakens as, as you said yesterday I mean I could watch The Force Awakens but to be honest I'd probably just rather watch Star Wars I think you're right JJ's film is very much about making the the film his version of the originals you know that's him playing in his bedroom with his toys remaking A New Hope and Empire and that with his in his own way this is someone who's been given the opportunity, and, and Ryan Johnson, someone who's been given the opportunity to play in that world and is telling his story with those same themes and messages in that space. That is how I, I guess I'd interpret the difference. Um, yeah. So someone who uh, is, uh, lots of people think have done a dirty in this movie is uh, Captain Phasma. <laughs> I mean, you say they've done a dirty, but we established last time out that they're here to play the... Um the Boba Fett role and, and I think they, they succeed in that uh, perfectly well they are the comedy heel and they play the comedy heel very well uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what else people expected to happen with Phasma they are they are the Boba Fett of the series and that's that's fine I don't think, is, is Gwendolyn Christie ever said she's really disappointed I don't think so I, I don't know I, mean, I, I remember at the time because there was a Phasma novel which came out, which went a lot more into the characterization and the like backstory, you know. and of course it explained where her armor comes from. If you didn't know, her armor is made from the, uh, Amidala's personal ship, where they melted it down and made this armor, and blah 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 blah. I don't uh, give a shit. She, well, you know, that's the thing; it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's, it's a cool, cool costume. I mean, yeah, it, it's kind of disappointing, but that just kind of leads all the way back to to Boba Fett. It's, it's the fact that you have a cool and interesting character in slightly different armour who is you know full of potential promise and then is just kind of unceremoniously killed off I, I like how menacing she is when she shows up and you know Gwendolyn Christie's line delivery sort of thing you know, FN 2187 so good to have you back I, I just oh, love how <laughs> I love how, how kind villainous. of um, yeah. matronly uh, bureaucratic it is as well you know it's evil but there's, an, there's a hint of bureaucracy in there um, mm -hmm. which, which I think is wonderful um, I, I think the thing that I really enjoy with Phasma this time or something I certainly noticed is uh, when her helmet gets smashed she's just a normal human underneath or you know appears yeah. human she's and I think that's a really interesting thing to, to note that she's she's not mind controlled she, she wants to be there she wants to do those things she is she has free will this is choice she is a horrible person she's not terribly scarred like Anakin was she's not tortured she's just a person who enjoys being a murderous asshole yeah I mean I, I can definitely highly recommend reading the I, I think it's just called Phasma let me just quickly check um but there was the tie-in novel for her and it goes into her backstory and yeah she is she's ideologically uh, aligned with being in the position that she is in this wasn't a case of uh, it, it, it was oh I'm you know a victim of circumstance or if I could do this I can could have escaped my horrible past it's like nope straight up I'm, I'm straight up on board with her being absolutely horrible and all this sort of stuff so uh, it's called Phasma yeah so it's called 
It's called Star Wars Phasma. But yeah, that's worth checking out if, if you do want to get some more of a backstory there. Uh, I, th- I feel we should probably speak a little bit about Benicio del Toro's character, the, uh, the Codebreaker. Um, yes. I remember... It, I was initially a bit unsure because he's got quite a a, a distinct uh, audio tick, you know, his little stammer, his stutter. He, he was doing a thing. Um, yes. Is, it, it's, it's, it's no more or less different to, to anything else we've got in other bits of Star Wars and all this. Um, I, I think it's an interesting character, but what I think is most interesting about him is the fact that we don't really know anything about him outside of this. He, he's very much a... You, you know who he is? Archetypally. He's Han Solo. Basically. Well, I think that's why people hate him so much, because when we've experienced smugglers and nerd worlds like this in the past, they've always turned out to be good. And he's not. He's He is very clearly chaotic neutral. He'll go where the money is. That is how he survives in this universe. And frankly, he's the most real character, I think, out of all of them. Um because he he only has himself to worry about, to think about, and to, to follow. Uh, I, I Again, I think I because I tied in with the casino stuff, I remember the casino stuff being way longer. I remembered him being uh, a lot more irritating and sh- shit, basically. Mm-hmm. And actually watching it now, I had no issue with his character. Um, it's not a character I have any affinity to. They were there. They did their job. They fulfilled the narrative purpose. I, I, I like his uh, interactions with BB-8, which are great. You know, when he, when he comes around the corner and bb is like hogtied all the guards. And it's like, yes. you did this? <laughs> and then later um, on, you stole the ship? and you, um, We stole the ship. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I choose to believe there's a great heist sequence of BB-8 and, and Del Toro over there uh, stealing yeah. the ship. Um, BB-8's a, kind of a murderous psychopath, and I also kind of love that too. Um, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, oh no, are these, is this person dead? Did I, oh, never mind, bye. Um, no, they were they were inoffensive. They, he was a double crosser. I think he he was like a Lando as well. He kind of filled that space um, mm. a little bit where, you know, they come to him for help and he double crosses them. Uh, the difference is, yet again, he's more nuanced than, than the characters in the original series and he doesn't turn up a good guy in the end. He's a bad guy. Yeah. He's a wrong un. Yeah, and that's the thing. It, it, as, as you say earlier, every time we've encountered these characters throughout in Star Wars, they've always had a heart of gold, haven't they? Or they've always come through and they've done a good thing. And, and, and he's he's straight up. He's going, hey, I took a uh, we, we took a shot, we lost, so I cut a deal. You know, that's just that that, that, that is how the characters would exist in in the world that it's presented as. And you know, it, it, it's further kind of feeding into that deconstruction there uh, I mean the last big thing I want to talk about uh, I, I, just because you know we're going to end up running longbow is I really want to talk about Ray and the subject of who is Ray because you mean the last thing you want to talk about before Crate which is my favourite thing in the whole world and I could do a whole podcast on just on its own but yeah let's talk okay, about hey, Ray the last thing I want to talk about and then we can talk about Crate which is your favourite thing in the world but I absolutely love how this film democratises the force because prior to this point, the only way you could be uh, a Jedi user from what we've seen in the films is if you were basically related to one. It was so nepotistic. And and you look at, you know, Anakin Skywalker being at Luke and Leia Skywalker, who then, you know, did all this, you know, stuff. It, 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 it's this whole sense that you had to be related. And in the run-up to this film, there was this huge speculation about who's Rey's parents. You know, is it... Is it Obi Wan? Did Obi Wan do this? Is, is it Han and Leia somehow? Is it Luke? Is it? There was speculation galore over who was Ray's parents, and the revelation that they were nobodies. They were a couple of um, drunks who sold off their kid to pay for more wine, and they now in a pauper's grave. I fucking love that because it tells you it doesn't matter who you are or where you came from. Anyone is capable of greatness. You have it within you regardless and one of the things that makes me so angry about the rise of skywalker is it undoes that almost immediately i think jj was furious that the reveal of ray's parents i think jj had a plan of who it was supposed to be i'm not necessarily sure if it was going to be palpatine but i think jj had a plan buried in a mystery box gave that to ryan johnson and ryan johnson went isn't it kind of cooler if she's nobody no 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 he took he took the mystery box and he threw it over his shoulder. <laughs> he did. He, he lightsabered it. Um, I think I think it's genius having her as no one. I really do. And 
I think, as you say, it democratises it. I know people said it's a chance for, to, for to people to Mary Sue. Well, what the fuck was Luke Skywalker then, if not a Mary Sue? I'm really sorry, but you can, you know, eh, to that one. Yeah. Uh, I I really suspected she was going to be an, uh, a Kenobi um, or have some yeah. relation to Obi-Wan. Um, that was my expectation. Um, and... Even in the third film, I think I'd have been okay if they'd said she was an Obi Wan, a, a Kenobi, um, or had some relation to Kenobi. Um, but I loved her being nobody. I think that was, as you say, and there's a there's a lot of the forces is for everyone in this. You know, we're gonna. I'm sure we'll touch on it. But the kid at the end uh, with the broomstick. You know, you don't yeah. have to be a Skywalker. Anyone in the universe can have the force. It really, as you said, undid the midichlorian stuff and the forces around us. And it's just about how much you can tap into it. And Maz said that in the first film you know that it was a force all around us so it's just building on that we had hints of that in jj's film in the first place so there's, there's, uh, there's a particular line that uh, kylo says to, to rain he goes you have no place in this story you came from nothing you mean nothing and and i love that that is the sense that he has he he, he feels like being a skywalker being the son of uh, Leia and Han Solo being the grandson of Darth Vader gives him power gives him right he he he, he is it's his supposed, purpose it, it is his purpose it is it is his destiny it is his legacy to be to to have the force and it's something that Luke says you know herein is the first lesson the Jedi do not have uh, a monopoly on, on the force to say that with no Jedi is there no light is arrogant I love that theming I love that messaging this sense that if you don't appreciate the thing in just the right way it is not valid. That is absolutely bullshit. This film is so full of subtext where I feel Johnson's talking directly to the people watching it saying, and he's talking about Star Wars. He's just saying, because people don't appreciate the thing in the same way you appreciate it doesn't mean it is less valid because some little girl with no connection to Star Wars prior to this wants to engage with his fandom and can't name all of the Stormtrooper numbers from the first film doesn't make it any less valid. They're still welcome in this world. They still matter. They still have a place. That's what I love about this film. And I think it was a bold choice to do, not just the fact that she was no one, but the way to portray that in the cave as well, you know, with her clicking the fingers and art, oh, it was beautiful. Oh, and, and the aftermath when she's, when she's retelling that story and you think she's telling it to Luke, but she's telling it to Ben. Why is it so good? It, it's magnificent. It, it, it really is a great film. Um, and, and look, I, I love it. Um, you wanted to talk about Crate Vo, uh, the planet of salt. Salty tears of the haters. I think ending on a white planet when they started empire on a white planet is just a really clever uh, a, a clever throwback to the middle film um like poetry it rhymes <laughs> <laughs> um but also i love how they've got round the blood in this and the fact that mm. it's white salt on a red rock surface and oh, I when think he slices Luke, through luke and his feet skip across it and it's just that red splash it's, even it's so before well done that, when yeah. when you've got um i love the walkers in this the the updated walkers um mm -hmm. i know we said when we watched it we thought the walkers were perfect i love the unnecessary engineering on these the over engineering <laughs> of the first order and how menacing they look and they don't need to but they did um i thought they were a good update and i like the fact we didn't dwell on them they were there but it was not like oh boy look at the new 8080s aren't they cool um they were just there but there's a shot from the command center, as it were, onto uh, the the blaster doors, and just the red smear. The that is so clearly meant to be blood, and the blood of the of the rebellion, and the blood of what is now sixty years of hope, just smeared everywhere. And just the, it's such a a powerful message, and really again highlights the the terrible fate that these people are in and i know they escape we all know they escape but it still feels really touch and go here you know and they're sending a signal out and no one comes um no one comes to their aid because people are too scared hope has been extinguished from the galaxy is what leia says yeah. and it's just to feel the hopelessness it's heartbreaking um and you know they go out in those little um skippers 
Are they call them skippers, the, the little yeah, the, the little speeder things that they have. Um, and I love which the fact are, that rickety junk. <laughs> you know, yeah, Homer literally puts his foot through it. <laughs> but I love that as well. That you know they are taking, they are, there is nothing left to fight the evil that is coming for them and yet they will still stand there and they will stand there strong and it's fucking beautiful trench warfare again you know and we see the trenches and it feels like it it feels like they're going over the the it feels like the Somme of world war one you know it's we have not seen war depicted so well since empire in my Mm -hmm. opinion and i think they do it really well in this and yeah and then obviously luke talking to oh, Leia and I, I love their interaction that's so powerful it's, it's, it's such a beautiful little mo- sequence I know as what well. you're going to say what am I've I going to say I've changed my hair yeah <laughs> I just and I love that she's joking with her brother and they both know that they are never going to see each other again and it's mm-hmm. not she knows it's not even him he's in exile he never leaves his, but he went to his planet to die and he will die there he is dying there to spark hope in a rebellion which is what he did in a new hope he was a new hope he is yet again igniting the hope um and being the last jedi you know Mm -hmm. and it is it is powerful beyond words the dialogue is beautiful we've not spoken about it in this i did not feel hammy dialogue in this film at all like yes but we we, we've discovered why haven't we Mm, mm, we have Go go on tell the people carrie fisher was the script doctor for it Carrie Fisher yeah. got to write the Star Wars. Not officially, but she did. No, um, it's, it's great. And, and I, I tell you what is also fantastic, if you get a chance, look at the behind the scenes of the, uh, the scene between Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher when they're just doing that final sequence. It's so moving. It's so beautiful. Th- this is a, another reason why I'm so annoyed at what J.J. Abrams did in The Force Awakens by killing off House and Ford, because you can see these two sharing this moment together on screen. And it's like, we should have had that for all three of them. And we didn't. And people point to this film and blame this. And, and no, the problem st- stemmed from The Force Awakens. You can only work with what you've been given at that point. And he was very definitely killed off. There was no... Oh, yeah. Uh, you weren't going to get him back from that, I felt. And Harrison Ford didn't want to come back. Yeah. I you got him for one, basically, and that was it. Um, but and yeah, the the JJ bit... wanted his mystery box. He wanted his Luke mystery box at the end. And just, yeah, their conversation together, and it's just, it's not tinged with sadness, but it is very, it's tinged with sadness, but it's not a sad conversation. Mm. And, you know, they forgive each other for creating Kylo Ren um, and Luke goes out to face him because that's what I he love, has I to love do. A little, I love a little nod and a wink towards 3PO as well, which was uh, Mark Hamill's idea. He goes, yeah. you know, I, I would acknowledge it, but it's just it's just such a little moment and it's, it, it works so well. But I love so the well. fact that we know it's not really Luke. If you actually look, you know, he's got his what? lightsaber, which we saw smashed in the previous scene. His hair's much shorter. He's bit, you know, he looks, he looks more like Luke Skywalker and less like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda, which is how he, yeah, you know, but, he's gone off. But what's great is it's not explicitly said at that moment. It's only there if you're paying attention. If you're caught up in the movie at that point, you're not thinking that. You might be thinking, oh, I didn't wow, notice he's had time to go in. time round at all. Yeah. When I saw it in the you cinema, I did not notice that. No, because you, you're not thinking about it. You're not, you're not engaged in those moments. But then, I mean, you think back to, to the first thing that Luke says to, to Ray. How did you think this is going to go? What, I'm going to go and face down the entire First Order with a laser sword? Um, yeah kind of does and, and i just love as well when when kylo sees him there and he goes i want every gun in the fleet to target that man and he just i don't know hux is like fuck me overkill but whatever just do it like oh hux just gets smacked across to the side i, I know. mean the pilot's just going like landing straight away sir. <laughs> yeah. i noticed this time when he's flown across the room by by ben um mm-hmm. he hits other people as well which i think is quite a nice touch you know it's it's uh, kylo ren is so focused on you know he's trying to put his anger he put his anger on his father in the last film and he's still angry and now he's putting it all on his mentor which is probably where most of it was due I'm not going to lie you know it didn't go great with uh, with uh, good old Luke over there uh, fucking up the Jedi um, but you know he puts all his anger and just all that that fight and all that blood and all that destruction and the fact that the man is stood there pristine and just wiped his shoulder off which oh, is oh yeah <laughs> But that's that's Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker was cheeky. That reminds me of the kid who got a snog from the beautiful princess in front of the guy that was madly in love with her. There is his sister, but we'll ignore that bit. You know, <laughs> it's that cheekiness that we see 
you know that we haven't seen we didn't get a chance to see and it's nice and it's nice that that that's still there he is still luke skywalker um under underneath the burden of legacy and legend I, I just want to also just circle back to to the flashback about when he tried to confront uh, Ben. Another thing a lot of people complain about is going, "Oh, Luke would never do that to his uh, yes, he would. to his nephew." No, but I, I love how it echoes. You know, when, when when he's given the actual account of what happens, he goes, "You know, I saw the darkness, and you know, it, it, in an instant, I ignited my lightsaber, and it passed like a fleeting shadow." But if you look at how it shots framed, and in that moment, it's just like that bit in jedi after he's cut off vader's hand and he looks down at his hand and you just have that moment of reflection and pause but ben's seen this he's awake and you know i i, I love it's, it's very rushamon they're both right what happened did happen to both of them but it depends on your point of from view a about the certain context. point of view yeah from, from a certain point of view and, and magnificent storytelling absolutely amazing and and so heartbreaking when you then look out at the temple burning and the kids all dead everywhere and he's just there with r2 ah I, I've been with Artu as well, playing that message. Help me, everyone. Kenobi, you're my only hope. That's a low blow. <laughs> yeah, what a prick. What a prick that droid is. And then at the end, then you finally have a moment where Poe has become the leader he needed to be at the end. And, and General Leia says, what are you looking at me for? He's the leader. Follow him. Beautiful. Beautiful. We've come full circle. We've had a, we've had an arc. Character arc. Someone developed. <laughs> I feel there's a lot of character development in this movie that we just were robbed of in the first movie. And the sequel, uh, the prequels robbed us a lot of um, character development as well during the films. Uh, yeah. And I feel this, this did a lot of character development, despite the fact it took place over a very short space of time you know mm-hmm. i think the whole film's meant to be over 20 hours or something it's a very very because we're, we're time windowed by the by the ship um you know and yeah and then they escape crate and ah, oh, the last minute there's a rock slide but then ray lifting all the boulders um it's, lifting stones. Know, it's always lifting stones <laughs> it is always lifting stones but then finn comes through and they move out the way which i think could be a little nod at his jedi-ness or his force sensitivity um if you choose to read it that way or Ray's just moving them out of the way but whichever the, the thing is he doesn't have any force stuff to do in this film but as you say he's not not a Jedi it's not explicitly said he doesn't have the thing it, just because it's not been built upon this is as you say the, the very next day of what's happened in The Force Awakens so yeah the, you're the, not the, talking this is time. three years later they're, they're, yeah um, and I, I quite like the relationship we see budding between Rose and, and Finn there uh, which I would totally buy is... that as a romantic relationship in this movie. Oh, well, JJ wouldn't, so don't you worry. <laughs> well, the audience also had other things to say. Um, but yeah, I, I think the relationship between Rose and Finn is lovely. And actually, I think when he doesn't kiss her back is really nice because, you know, he's been he's been a, a, a brainwashed soldier for his entire life. Love is not the thing on his mind. Um, and I think, I think actually, that's a really bit of good acting by John Boyega there. Um, mm about how he kind of interprets that kiss and is not in a place to deal with it immediately but I really but you know he clearly cares about it. he then pulls the blanket over her you know all he's focused on is getting her the medical attention and getting her her scene to so I call bullshit that he doesn't love her back but we'll never know because mm. she's not in the next movie uh, because That's true because JJ hated her um, and replaced her with a slug alien yeah Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the very, very final shot of this movie oh, is yes. w- one that I hate. You do? I don't like it. You don't like the boy with the uh, the broom looking up at the sky? Oh, I find it's really cheesy, but oh, I don't I like, like it. it. <laughs> I don't like it because I am uh, a fan of the grisly war film aspect of this. Well, I, I can appreciate it, but I don't like it. I don't personally like it. That's okay. I appreciate that is what makes it a Star Wars film, and that is what really ties the story off. What I think is really funny is it's a massive two fingers at whatever third movie is coming after this, because that, that shot of the boy, you know, grabbing the broom uh, with his with his force powers and looking up at the stars that is the end of the trilogy that shot is the end of the third film not the end of the second film um i think they had a perfect ending for the for the for the sequels right there yeah yeah i i love that final shot i love that sequence i i, I love how you know as they say you know this we have a spark that will uh create the fire that will burn down the first order and it's showing it's that power of myth of storytelling you have these kids 
who are there telling the story about how Luke Skywalker stood down the entire First Order, and you know, yeah, he's got he's got a shitty life. He, you know, I'm presuming he's a slave, just given everything else going on there. But you know, w- without calling attention to it, without it being a big thing, he just uses the Force to pull the uh, the, um, uh, the broom towards him and, and goes sweeping and looks up at the stars with his um, little rebellion ring that he got from uh, Rose there, and it's. <laughs> It's democratized the force. It's it's a sense of hope of of potential in the future of of the stories yet to come. I love the ending of this film. I love this film, uh, and it it saddens me that people. <laughs> it, it saddens me that so many people do not appreciate this and and outright hate this film. And I can only hope that you know in the fullness of time in in, a, in about 15 years as we've seen with the prequels when there's a bit of distance people will come back to reevaluate this film and I, I really hope they'll love it the same way I love it because I just want to share this film with people I love this film this is my favourite film in the Star Wars saga but we haven't seen them all yet this is my favourite film in the Star Wars saga but we haven't I'm seen con- them all yet I am very confident in that statement <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so there you go. I'm, I'm uh, glad. Think... I'm glad this was our first film of 2024. Oh God, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I could have faced being um, <laughs> the Rise of Skywalker. Uh... <laughs> well, if it wasn't this one, if we were doing it in true release order, it would have been Rogue One, which I'm yeah. happy with as the first one. But that does mean we would end on a Rise of Skywalker. Um, I, I, I don't care. Um, I'm sad for everyone who's listening, who's probably tuned out a while ago because this is by far our longest recording. Um, oh, but they, they just saw that the title was uh, The Last Jedi and they just skipped this one. As I said, as you said, I hope one day people can see this film for what it is. And I wanted to come into this film and I wanted to be really critical of it and I wanted to be able to say, actually, there are these bits that, that, that don't do it or, or uh, give reason for people's opinion. And I'm afraid I've come out not thinking that at all, sadly. Well, I don't think we've changed anyone's mind. If you liked it, you're probably still going to like it. If you hated it, you're probably still going to hate it. Um, let's just but hope that we can tomorrow continue. When we watch The Rise of Skywalker, the pinnacle, the end, the summing up of nine films over 40 years worth of storytelling is going to be summed up all in one film. I can I can sum up how I'm uh, feeling about this in, in a single image. It's that shot of Ben Affleck standing outside, just sighing while having a smoke. That's, that's very much my... Um, mental image of me going through the rise of skywalker so uh, we'll see if that pans out won't we well we will see tomorrow to see if somehow one of us returns <laughs>